Hi everyone, it's Nicole. Welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be talking about my Flossversary Summer Sal 2023 finishing. This is my finishing tutorial for the sal where I combined the Cherry Hill Stitchery Stars and Stripes and Red, White, and Bloom. For this, I am using the Chantal's 141 Design Plentiful Pocket. If this looks familiar, this is because this was the finishing for the More Chocolate Bunnies Easter or Spring Sal that we did, but I really wanted to show how versatile this board is and how it can be used for a lot of different stitches. Part of the reason I picked the two charts that I did and combined them the way I did was because I thought that they would fit this front of this pocket and I think a lot of charts are really going to fit this. Um, even think maybe some of the stitching with the housewives and there they have some charts that are around this size that would be really cute. The finishing of the pocket front itself is seven and a half by eight and a half. So as long as your chart fits that or slightly smaller to account for mounting on press on board or things like that, um, you should be good to go. So that is the size of that finishing board and I will throw that up on the screen here in a little bit. For my finishing today, I decided to do something different. We did a completely different technique for the More Chocolate Bunnies. This time I am using some of the Tommy Art paint. This is a product that um, I have picked up recently and I have a lot of different ones. You're gonna notice, um, so full disclosure, I actually didn't like what I did first and I did not get a new plentiful pocket. I simply covered it up with another layer of this paint. This is the navy blue color. I knew I wanted to use the navy blue. So what I'm doing on the plentiful pocket, both the base and the pocket, you'll notice I have not put them together yet, is that I am painting them. I am just taking this, it's called mineral paint, and I am applying a a nice even coat, well it doesn't look so even yet, to the board. It's pretty forgiving paint, it's awesome, and I would say use whatever paint product you like here. Um, definitely check out Chantal's channel for lots of other painting and finishing techniques. This is just something I really wanted to try. Two products are all you're gonna need for the technique I'm showing today. So the navy blue base paint, and then I am gonna use white wax on top, which will also be my sealant for the paint. That's one of the great things about this. Now, once I have this layer on, I do wanna let this completely dry. You'll notice I'm going over it and making sure it's kinda nice and smooth. It does even out beautifully. You can sand it. There are so many techniques you can do with this paint. I am kind of obsessed. I want to do all of the things. Um, there's lots of different waxes and um, kind of antiquing, and I'm not gonna leave the because it's not a mistake. I'm not going to leave the first technique I did in the video because otherwise it would be way too long, but I will try it on another video. To me, it was too similar and too distressed for what I wanted today. Um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. Now this navy is pretty intense. It, it is a beautiful color. I love it, but I tend to like a little bit of weathering for my finishes, some more than others. The More Chocolate Bunnies was really weathered. This one is not going to show as much weathering, but you're going to see it because I chose a white wax other, other rather than a neutral wax or the antiquing wax. And the reason I picked the white wax is that one of the things you can do with it, you can even take it straight to your board and it kind of gives a white milk paint type finish, but I want it to kind of soften the effect of the navy and it ends up being like you guys the most perfect weathered color um, i absolutely love it i want to try it with all the colors i think it would be absolutely amazing um, if you don't want to do a weathered look if you prefer a more um, flat color like this and that's not a bad thing at all but if that is what you prefer you might want to consider sealing it with either a matte or gloss 
uh, varnish, which they also carry. You could also use the neutral wax, which is going to be a clear finish, and that would be beautiful for your board as well. Okay, so now it has dried. I promise it actually dried much prettier than this. This was the second coat when Nicole realized she didn't like her first technique and I covered up what I did. So you're gonna see some white poking through. It's okay. I could have painted it again, I didn't. And I also had already assembled the pocket. If you need to see how to assemble the plentiful pocket, please check out my video for the More Chocolate Bunnies finish. It has those risers that you saw me take out of the package at the beginning of the video. You simply glue those um, one on top of another, so you get six of them, and you saw the grid lines that are lasered into that background board. You glue them down there, and I like the tight bond glue, so that is how I do that. So now I put on a very generous uh, layer of the white wax, very generous. And then I have a dry cloth here, probably best to use a lint-free one, but this is what I had, so it's actually fine. And I am rubbing that wax into my board. And look at the difference between the, the top or the pocket and the backer. It just softens and dulls it. So I am going to go through and I am going to apply the rest of this wax to the board. I probably don't need to really use this much, um, but you know, there we go. So I was laying it on pretty thick. I'm wiping quite a bit off. You really, really don't need that much wax, guys. <laughs> this was Nicole zoning out, just having herself a good time with the wax and the paint. Uh, something I do want to mention, I have links to the brushes I used. I used a brush for the paint. That is a separate brush than you use for the wax. For waxes, you need to use like a round, stiff, bristled brush. I found these little brushes um, on Amazon for fairly inexpensive. In fact, they come with a, the flat brush and the round brush in a group. I just bought a couple of them. If you are using waxes, if you like to use waxes, or this is intriguing and fun for you, if you try this, um, do a different wax or a different brush pardon me for each wax that you have if you get a neutral use a brush for neutral if you get a white use a brush for white or the antique which is like a brown uh use a separate brush for each and they do not require cleaning uh, i would not use your wax brush for your paint um, you need to keep your paint brushes separate you can clean those with a little uh paint or paint soap and water um, but I am laying on that wax and you can literally leave it a little bit longer if you wanted to. I kind of let it sit there for a couple minutes or so and then I'm just wiping it, kind of rubbing it in to the surface of my board. And I, this is really where I was like, Nicole, why did you use so much wax? But that's neither here nor there. We've already discussed that I use too much wax. So I am just going to rub all of that product in. Now, yes, the back of my board, I didn't bother painting it. I didn't bother painting it because it's gonna lean against something. If you think this is going to sit out on an easel or, you know, like um, a sofa table or something where you're going to see the back of it, I would 100% paint the back of it to match the front. And I may still, honestly, I, I may still paint it, um, but, have fun with it. Just really, really have fun with it. Now, what I'm doing here, if you have another paintbrush and some like the antique white mineral paint, you could take a little bit of paint on your brush. Chantal has a really great demo of this on her channel and do what she calls as a linen technique where it gives you kind of a linen type look where you're dry brushing on the top paint color. I think that would be fun too. So yes, when you look down in that pocket, it's really ugly. And that's because I'd already adhered it before I realized I really didn't like what I did and uh, went ahead and changed it. I'm applying a little bit more wax um, here and I did let it sit for a second and then I'm just going to um, wipe that off. Not only is the wax serving to kind of dull and whitewash over the navy, but it's going to seal in the paint. So no need for an extra layer of varnish or anything like that. 
Uh, I'm very, very happy with this. Even though the inside of the pocket's super ugly, we are going to stuff that pocket full of amazing picks uh, that I picked up on super sale at Joann's. In fact, at the time of filming this, which is um, obviously late June of 2023, they are like I don't know, they were 70, I think they're 90% off now. I did link what I could find. And here are the two products again. Okay, I am gonna go and I'm gonna clean up all of this stuff and then we are going to um, start putting it all together. Oh, no, I so lied. Um, so I did have a little paint go off the edge. I probably will go ahead and take this outside and use my electric sander to remove some of that paint from around the edge that looks kind of messy. I'm just using a little sanding sponge-like thing I have. This literally I found it in my garage. I was like, oh yeah, I have this. I need to clean up some of that paint over the edge. And it serves not only to kind of clean up some of the paint along the edges there, but I want to very, very lightly distress the edges of my board. We are not going for super distress. The wax layer for this is providing that weathered appearance that I really, really like, but I'm going for cleaning up. So if there's a little bit of glue from the layers where I glued those together, or if there is, you know, the paint around the edges, but I just wanna go around all the edges of my board with this sander. And again, this is probably too fine of a grit. A little bit more coarse grit would probably work a little easier, but if you don't want to over sand, tr start with a very light grit sandpaper, uh, just to make sure you kind of keep keep from sanding off all your hard work and having to start over. But don't be afraid to start over. If you don't like how you paint it the first time, you can always, always repaint it. Uh, don't be afraid. You could even sand it all off. Um, if I had not ap applied or adhered, pardon me, the pocket to the board, I probably would have taken it and sanded it outside and just sanded off as much of the old paint as possible. But I didn't want to, so... I didn't <laughs> and it was thunderstorming when I was doing this so I didn't really want to do it in the garage either but I'm just going around those edges and you can kind of see a little bit of that base color peeking through and I'm taking my time I'm taking my time I'm going around all the edges keeping it pretty minimal but again I love it and especially right here around the top. This part's gonna show, um, just because we're gonna have obviously picks and stuff inside of our pocket and our beautiful stitch on the front of the pocket. Everything we're doing is to emphasize the stitch. Um, I always try to remember that when I am finishing something, is, is it going to emphasize the stitch or is it too much? So if you're doing stuff, take something away if you feel like it's too much. And don't be afraid. When I was finishing, I will say, I thought, you know, I did another co covered button. And I thought, you know, do I do that too much? Well, no. If that is what I like, then do that. Everyone should do what they like. Do you guys see some of your favorite finishers and you think, I know exactly who finished that because they have maybe their signature thing? I love that. You can always change up a few things but you know, don't be afraid to do what you love, basically. So I'm just kind of, I have my dust buster. I'm getting rid of some of my sanding. I don't normally sand in here, but, but here we are. Uh, I am going to take, this is a very, very slightly damp cloth. It is not wet. And I am just getting rid of some dust. Before I touch my stitch to this at all, I want to get rid of all of the dust. And full disclosure, all of the painting um, and wax and everything was done a day before all of the finishing. So um, I let it sit. You don't have to, but I did let it sit and completely, you know, like dry and all of that good stuff. In fact, full disclosure, the ugly paint happened first. <laughs> It wasn't ugly. <laughs> you guys know what I mean. The first painting happened one day, the other painting happened the next day, and then all the finishing happened the third day. I drug this bad boy out for three days. <laughs> so here are the picks I picked. I bought lots of different ones. This one is gonna be a no. 
And this is why it's good to have options. Literally, my favorite time to buy picks for finishing, you guys, even if I don't know what I'm going to do with them, is at the 90%, 70 to 90% off sales at Hobby Lobby, Michael's, Joann's, because I put them in bins labeled for the holidays, um, and I, then I can go down and I have finishing. And I usually do buy multiples because I know that when I do something like this, even if I'm just using it for display, let's say I'm tucking these in a vase or I'm tucking them around a base or putting them in a wreath. I like multiples. I think I bought like three each of all the colors, but I decided I'm going to use all three of this design that I bought, which is what I call a multi. It's red, white, and blue. You can see it's got some little metal stars in it. And I am going to then tuck two of the white picks in between. These also came in blue and red. You may check to see if they're still available. They had a couple of different styles. The other style is the one I nixed. I ended up really, really liking this one. And for me, I like my pocket full. So, and I like it to be an odd number. So yes, I am gonna do those three multi-picks and then the two white picks in between. And while they're all kind of going in straight right here, I am going to angle them and I will hot glue them so they don't move. I am not gonna use my board for another season or occasion. I do not decorate seasonally with navy blue very often. It obviously lends itself perfect for patriotic. Um, so everything on mine is just completely secured to the board. But if you are someone who picked up the board for more chocolate bunnies and you used magnets and washers and you can just swap out your picks, you could easily swap out your picks and swap out your stitch on the front and that would be great. So I kind of am um, auditioning fabric, trims, ribbon, all the things, right? And I did stitch this little star. This was from the Red, White, and Bloom. So Red, White, and Bloom is where the basket came from on my design. And I'm gonna use the one and one eighth inch. I'd already checked to make sure it fit. Uh, I, I used my guide on one of the other stars I stitched on my piece before I took the time to stitch that up. And because it fit, I'm gonna go ahead and use this to make a covered button to finish off the center of my bow. This beautiful plaid ribbon also picked up at Joann's. Joann's really brought it this year. I always find it funny where I really enjoy things and I have to think, I believe it's Lori, if I'm wrong, I hope I apologize. She had messaged me on Facebook and said, that, not the floral picks that I'm, or the picks I'm using here. They're a little bit bigger, they're really tall, but she had shown me these other picks at Joann's and I immediately went and that's when I've got a bunch of stuff 70% off. But I did get the ones she sent me to use as decoration that I'm using for my patriotic decor this year. Um, funny story, you're like, what are you doing? Um, all of these backs, and I don't know how I got so many plain backs. I really thought this was a button kit. It's totally fine. I usually don't like the shank on it anyway, but they were all stuck. And so I'm peeling all of these out. I have no idea how that even happened. But I traced the uh, button shape on my linen. And then I'm gonna go ahead and uh, make my button. So you trace the shape. If you haven't watched my button making tutorial, I will link that down in the description because I think it's it's helpful to see it done. But we're going to cut this out of the linen. I had plenty of extra in this piece here. Otherwise, I would have just grabbed more from my stash. This is the Saltbush Fox and Rabbit 32 count linen, and I just want my button to match. And then once we have that, let me move my stuff out of the way. We have our form, this clear form. We are going to center our stitch and then we're going to take the button shape and as much as you can center it. Generally, because I have nails, it's hard for me to stick my finger down in there. So I use like, I'm using my paintbrush. <laughs> Uh, and then we're going to shove that down. We're going to fold in all of those edges just like this. We're going to take our back. This time I'm using a flat back, but you can use one with a shank. 
And then I like to use, I have a little craft hammer. I think we've talked about this before. I've had it forever. It's from Making Memories, which is no longer uh, there in the craft world, uh, the paper crafting world. But I've had this little hammer and I love it so much. It lives in my craft room because it's teeny tiny. And I like to just very gently and look at that perfect button. Oh my gosh, you guys, I love it so much. I love it so much. So perfect. I did pick the colors for this button to match the ribbon. I will say that I had picked all of this stuff out and then that the evening um, that I had done the board, I went ahead and went and stitched that because I was thinking, do I want to stitch it just like the ones in my stitch? Or what about the color combination from red, white, and bloom? I didn't stitch that part of the, the uh, chart for what I was doing. And I really liked it because it really picked up the colors of the ribbon. Um, I did link the ribbon down below as well for easy reference, hopefully. Um, I don't, again, I can't make any promises. It's very, very discounted. But if I can give you guys any advice for seasonal is uh, check, check at the end of the season and stock up on things that you actually really like, and then you have them for finishing the next year. So I am measuring my stitch right now. I'm using my little Lori Holt uh, tape measure. I absolutely love it. I did link that down below. My stitch measures about six and a half by seven and a half. So I've got, I, I need to trim down my linen and it, I need to press it first. So what I have is my wool pressing mat, and you can, you'll can you notice my stitch is upside down. That's because I also have my, my um, embroidery pressing cloth on top of my wool mat, which helps protect your stitches so they don't get so smashed. So I'm just using my small Oliso craft iron and I am pressing my linen. I'm pressing, pressing. I pressed multiple times while I was stitching this. Like every time I photographed it or sh showed it in um, floss tube, I'm trying to be better about ironing <laughs> my stitches before I just decide to go on camera. But that was, well, the pressing cloth will help you um, not have smashed stitches. And you guys, can I just reiterate how happy I am that I changed my fabric I was stitching on? I absolutely love it. All the colors pop, they look amazing. Um, funny story, I was missing one of the colors for the word forever. It wasn't used anywhere else in the chart and I kept thinking I'd get to Michael's or Hobby Lobby and I'm so lazy I didn't get there. Uh, I actually ripped out the middle color and I just used the light, light blue color for the center and moved the more what I would call a royal blue to the to the you know on the other side of it so don't be afraid to what is the moral no don't be afraid to be lazy maybe i don't know i am using my square ruler and what i'm doing is i am trying to find the center of my stitch and i am trying to measure i start on the side of big you're going to see me cut this down as the video goes but i'm going to give myself a two inch border if you will, all the way around. So, and I have a hard time, every time I have just taken my ruler and my rotary cutter and gone to town, I have messed up every single time. In fact, I messed up something so bad that I've not finished yet because I just wasn't thinking it through. For me, I would rather, what what's the saying? Measure twice, cut once. So this little drawn line serves as a as a bonus, I guess, if you will. So what I'm doing, measuring out two inches from the furthest stitch on each side. And then I like to double check it. Is it square? Just in case. Now, I don't really need two inches to wrap around the press on board. So I will trim this down in a little bit. But if that is a worry for you guys at all, I would say just cut your, your piece a little bit bigger than you think and then you have that peace of mind. 
for me, um, I wanted the peace of mind, and obviously I knew I wouldn't be able to restitch the whole thing before I needed to film this, so <laughs> I did not want to mess this part up. This is the most crucial part. Everything else can be fixed. If you don't cut your fabric right and that's all the fabric you had, well, that's you can get more fabric. That's easy. But the hours spent stitching, I just feel like it's best to take your time. Once I have it, I am going to then take my ruler and a rotary cutter and I am just going to cut each side just like so and really trying to be careful not to pull my linen too much. Depending on the fabric you use, obviously linen is going to be a little stretchier and yes, part of that little where I cut the button out but I know that I'm gonna trim this down more. This is way more border than I actually need. And that will be hidden in the seam, in like the seam allowance is what you'd call it for quilting, but it'll be hidden back behind. It'll be part that gets wrapped around if I do need to keep it. And our final side. And I know this is very tight, <laughs> long in time. It's not very interesting, but to me, that's probably the most important part of the whole process. Okay, I've got some 8x10 press on board. You could get a bigger piece and you can get both of your, your backer for the panel and then your backer for the fabric out of one. Um, I actually have quite a few different pieces and I just grabbed whatever was convenient. I have seen so much talk about what do you use to cut. Um, I have a guillotine cutter. I don't think it works very well. I have used just a ruler and a craft knife, or even a craft knife isn't that great. A box cutter is usually what I like to use because I feel like it works best. But I was gifted this rotary cutter from the company I work for, and this is a Tim Holtz rotary cutter. And I have to tell you guys, it has completely changed how I feel about press on board and cutting press on board. It is pricey. So I know that it's not for everyone, but it has, it cuts perfect. It, it cuts perfect. You can replace the blades. I have not so far. I take it right from cutting press on board. I would probably cut a couple of pieces of scrap paper after the press on board just to make sure. And I am going to draw a line. And the reason being is I actually cut the first piece of press on board, um, wrong. <laughs> so we're, we need to make sure that we're going to cut this one correctly this time. I, I was having, I cut it a quarter of an inch too short. I, I guess measuring was hard. We, we've all said counting is hard. So let's just add measuring is hard too. And all you do is just run it and it cuts. You guys, I, I promise if you do a lot of finishing and you are looking for a great tool, I cannot recommend this enough. I have been blown away. It's my favorite thing to use for cutting the press on board. Absolutely amazing. Okay, once we have that, yeah, see, here's the one that's wrong. So let's just move that. That press on board can be used for something else. I... Yeah, see, it's a quarter of an inch. I wanted to show that just so you guys could see how funny it is. Funny for me, maybe. Okay, I have some scraps of batting. I use warm and white in my quilting and I always have scraps, so that's what I use. I am going to do two layers of this. That's my preference. I did one to start with and I was like, why is my stitch so flat? Um, because I like two. This is pretty thin batting. Um, keep that in mind. So if you're using like a poly cotton mix and it's already pretty, it has a nice loft, you probably don't need two pieces. It just really depends on the look you're going for. I like two. So then I peel off the sticky side and then I'm placing my batting right on top of that. Just like so. And then I'm going to place one more piece on top of that as well. So even though you're going to see me, I'm just double checking. This is the other thing that I feel like I double check a ton is double check before you start securing your stitch to the board. Does it fit? 
Is there anything that's wrapping around the side? Does it look funny? I like to use these Clover Wonder Clips. I use them for everything all the time, but they're great for this step as well because it's going to give you a great, if you're visual, and I'm a very visual kind of person, I need to see it how it's going to look before I commit to securing everything down. And I like to kind of do the whole thing, and then I'm gonna show you what this looks like on the board, and then we're going to work on the backer piece. My backer piece is going to be just a half inch bigger. So I want to remind you, and I will have all of this information down in the description below, the stitch and the sticky board, or I guess I should just say that this, this piece of press on board that the stitch is on is six and a half by seven and a half. The board that I am going to cut for the fabric that's going to go back behind here is seven by eight. And then the pocket itself is seven and a half by eight and a half. And we're basically covering most of the front, but the stitch is the star of the show. So for me, that's totally fine. So here I've got my rotary cutter again, and this time we're going to cut it to seven by eight. And I'm just double checking, and yes, it's already eight inches. And those little strips of uh, press on board are great if you've got some little ornaments. I'm gonna hold on to those because for our little ornament for our next um, Christmas in July sale, the bonus for that, I think that'll work great for that or any kind of ornament for the holidays. Okay, so just like before, we want to wrap our fabric around. So here I've got some fabric from my stash. This is an old Sweetwater fabric. I am sure you may be able to find it um, on Etsy or eBay, I don't know, but they tend to have a lot of the same colors. So instead of maybe this collection, which I have no idea which one it is, I didn't even look. Um, but the stateside collection is their most recent collection and the reds from there are going to complement. I mix their collections all the time because they always go together. Most of your favorite designers are going to do that. So I grabbed what I liked from my stash and part of the reason this is the fabric I picked because there were a couple of plaids I was leaning towards but I have that plaid ribbon and I really, really wanna use that plaid ribbon. I love a little bit of pattern and especially a small pattern. You're not gonna see a ton of this. It's only a half inch bigger than our stitch panel. We're only seeing a tiny bit of it, but I, so I like the pattern to be tiny so you see the pattern. And I think this little bitty kind of uneven stripe is going to be perfect. So once I have it ironed really well, I'm going to take my press on board and I'm gonna cut around it. And I'm not even gonna use a cutter or a cutter. I am gonna use a cutter. I'm not gonna use a ruler. I'm just going to take my rotary cutter and just cut a little strip here off. Then I can put the rest of my fabric away. And once I have my fabric how I want, or have it lined up, pardon me, the way I want, then I can go ahead and trim it down. And I'm just gonna trim mine, I think, what, maybe an inch bigger? I guess we'll see. I'm putting the rest of my fabric back on my little bolts. These are the fabric organizer bolts. By the way, I have the bigger ones that a yard or more go on, and then these little ones are usually a half yard. Okay, so now I need to figure out, do I want it to go horizontally or vertically? I think I am going to have my stripes go horizontal. We're peeling off the sticky board and I'm just gonna center it right in my fabric, like so. 
Then I'm gonna take a ruler and my rotary cutter and before I wrap my fabric around, I want to trim some of this off. For me personally, I don't like a lot of fabric on the back. And this is just something I have learned over the time of, of doing, um, of, of finishing, I guess I should say. I, I used to, I would have used to probably just left this, but the least amount of bulk you can have, the better. I think things lay nicer. Um, so for my personal preference, I'm just going to go around the sides and trim up a little bit of this. I did put the large size finishing circles in all four corners. And the reason I do that is because we are gonna fold the fabric in on those corners, and then we're going to fold in the side. So here is where I'm like, oh yeah, I've left way too much fabric. I don't like how it looks. Let's just put that backing circle back on and we're going to trim around the sides. And I like, I think I left an inch. I think I left an inch for both the cross stitch and the fabric backers. That should be enough to go around your board. So I am just gonna clean up all of these sides. I know no one is ever gonna see it, but for me, it just feels nice and neat and clean. And it's going to help with making those those corners by having a little less bulk. What I'm really trying to do is eliminate as much bulk as possible in the corners. So now I'm peeling up the backing for the circles and I'm going to just try to do a nice little corner here first. And then we will do all of the sides. And you can peel it up and put it back if you need to. That's one of the great things about this. And it's one of the reasons I like the finishing circles and the finishing tape, as opposed to using hot glue for this step. You can use hot glue, absolutely. Um, if you want to lace your cross stitch, I know I showed how to lace in the More Chocolate Bunnies or my version of lacing. Um, I actually didn't lace today. Sometimes I feel like lacing, sometimes I don't. That, that's just the way it is. That I almost felt like an Almond Joy commercial. Sometimes you feel like a nut and sometimes you don't, right? <laughs> and I'm going to put my finishing tape along the sides. And I'm just gonna work one side at a time. And I like to use something sharp. You could even like use the tip of your scissors or something. And then we're gonna fold in that side. And we'll do the two long sides and then the two short, or do the two short and then the two long, either one. But I think for consistency, that just allows it to fold a lot nicer. And again, if you would prefer to use hot glue here, by all means, you can hot glue this down. This tape just allows a little more forgiveness. Like you'll you'll notice there's a couple of corners I'm like not super happy with. Well, if you're not super happy with the tape, you can just pull them up. You can pull it up and put it back. Okay, it's looking good. I'm happy. Okay, let's go ahead and do these other two sides real quick. So I am just going to speed up this part a little bit until we get to the, the step for cross stitch. And then I will show you a couple of sides for the cross stitch and then I will speed that up as well. And you can see, look how I am rearranging the corners, making sure they're nice and tight. I want them to be as least amount of bulky as possible. Oh, love it. Oh yeah, that looks cute. Very, very happy with that. So let's grab our cross stitch and here's where I was like, oh yeah, you forgot your other piece of batting. So I'm just gonna cut another one out of a scrap and we're gonna do the same thing. So I already have my one piece of batting adhered to the sticky board or to the press on board, pardon me. And now I'm gonna take my stitch and I'm gonna place it over and we're going to do exactly what we just did for the fabric. Now, again, what you wanna be careful of is you wanna make sure this is centered before you start adhering it. So I'm just making sure that the distance from the text on my stitch 
the distance from the design at the top and the bottom is as even as possible. I do want to go around all four sides and I'm going to trim those up just like I did with the fabric layer and we're going to cut those to one inch as well. That's going to help reduce bulk. This does tend to be a little bit I think the, that the linen, um, Ada especially, they're going to be a little more bulky. So trimming it down, reducing the bulk is going to help. And even if you lace it, uh, I think it would be okay to trim it down. Just finish it however you like. And that will get rid of that little uh, notched area on my linen as well. Okay, so now we're going to do, to do the exact same thing that we did for the fabric layer where we add the finishing dots to all four corners and then we add the finishing tape to the sides. And I am going to speed this up a little bit just to save some time since it's the exact same thing, but I do wanna leave it in so you can see kind of how I work with the linen. I think we will take a couple of clips just kind of in the center, help hold that where I want it. And we're gonna start folding in our corners. And you can see how having a little less fabric there just helps a ton with reducing the bulk. Because I do end up rearranging and kind of manipulating this much more than I did the fabric layer. And I'm trying to pull it around, get it as tight as possible. And then we're going to pull up these sides. And I'm smoothing out. I'm always checking the front. Always check the front of your stitch. Make sure it hasn't shifted. It hasn't moved up or down or to one side or the other. Whatever you can do to kind of ensure that it is not looking funny. And then once I have this, I'm going to double check and that corner is not good. I don't know what is going on there, but we need to wrap that around, wrap it tighter. We don't want our text going wonky, smooth it out, get it how you want it to look. That looks pretty good. Not too shabby anyway. And here's how it's going to look on the board. I'm so, so excited. I think it's going to be so pretty. Okay. So now I need to figure out my finishing trim. And I originally was gonna use this blue, which I do like. I think it matches the color of that whitewashed navy perfectly, but uh, it doesn't really match, or it's just a lot of blue. I feel like we need white. I think we our board is blue, the fabric is red, we need white trim. So I'm gonna grab, this is the Lori Holt Cloud Vintage Trim, and here is my hack for Rick Rack. Rick Rack, you want to cut in between the little valley there so that you're hiding the raw end back behind. And I know if you've watched some of my finishing tutorials before, you've seen me do this, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna hot glue these down or you could use tape. We're going to glue these to back behind each side rather than one continuous piece and it's going to allow it to lay so much nicer. It's really hard to go around the corners, whether you're sewing it in or gluing it in. And I'm just gonna take a bead of hot glue here. I've committed to the hot glue now. Um, we used our, our, our <laughs> sticky and finishing circles and tape and all of the things, but now we've got the hot glue. And I am gonna, I want my little points of my rickrack to be poking out and we're gonna do each side, one side at a time. And you're gonna see, as I lay this down, the white just helps the stitch pop off of the fabric background perfectly. I'm going to do both long sides first, and then we will do the two short sides. And I'm going to do all of them the same, making sure that the raw edges of the rickrack are hidden back behind the stitch and not poking out. You don't want like that the raw edge to be one of those valleys that pokes out. Does I hope that makes sense? 
um, you want it to be tucked down below. So I'm always measuring and making sure where I end up cutting it, that little raw edge is glued down. So it just secures it. I don't have to worry about it. So I think this is going to be beautiful. I love it. I can already see that it's exactly, exactly what I was hoping for with this stitch. So let's do the two short sides now. And there, uh, the vintage trim comes in, first of all, tons of colors. It also comes in a large and a small. So there's a smaller size rickrack as well. If you want to do littler rickrack, this is a pretty big piece. So I really liked the bigger rickrack. I would say probably 80, 85% of the time I use the big rickrack, even though the tiny rickrack is the cutest thing ever. <laughs> but I just end up using the big rickrack the most. And again, just running a little bead of hot glue. This is the Sure Bonder cordless glue gun. I absolutely love it. Highly, highly recommend. I do have that linked down in the description below as well. I try to link as many things as possible. If I am missing anything, please, please let me know. And I am working nice and slow. I want it to be as even as possible. It's not a race. Look how cute it's looking. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm so happy. It's everything that I was hoping for with this finish. I think it is the perfect patriotic um, stitch. I love decorating and patriotic. It's one of my favorite. Um, it's one of my favorite seasons to stitch, to decorate for, and always was, even when I wasn't cross-stitching really so much. I love decorating for it. So something about that red, white, and blue that I love. And it doesn't matter. If you are not stitching patriotic or you're stitching for your country, you can take a lot of these same ideas and implement them in your country's colors. Or maybe you're doing a summer stitch and you want to do a whole bunch of, you want to finish your board, wouldn't it be awesome in like an eggshell blue or or that aqua-ish color or whatever the case may be with the whitewash finish and do like a beach finish on here and have some really fun beachy picks coming out. I know I've seen a ton of sunflower stuff like at Michael's, that would be amazing. Uh, so whatever you're stitching, even you guys, a bee stitch, a bee stitch with sunflower picks and things coming out the top um, would be incredible. We might have to revisit that. <laughs> Okay, so I glued down my stitch board with the rickrack sandwiched in between. I hot glued it to the fabric and then I hot glued the fabric board right to my plentiful pocket. Now I have some of that plaid fabric and I just, I cut one piece and notched the ends and then I cut another piece and folded it and it overlaps a little bit little bit and I just have a needle and some thread and I'm doing a running stitch down the center to gather it. This is how I like to make bows that have a hidden center because I feel like they look the best. And then I'm just wrapping my excess ribbon around the center a few times and then I'm going to secure that on the back. and we'll glue that down in place right right above the stitch and kind of over the picks now i will say off camera i ran a bead of hot glue down each of my picks and i tucked them into the pocket that's so that they don't go anywhere and i angled them if you will notice they all are kind of going in the v shape i started with the center pick and then i did the two white on either side and ended with the two multis on either side of that and I did put that hot glue down each so it's kind of glued down inside and then there's kind of a little messy section but the bow is going to cover that on the back of the backer board so we won't see it that's kind of how I craft we hide imperfections so I'm going to put a little bead of glue on the back of my bow first just like so, and then we're gonna figure out right where we want that to go. And I'm gonna press that down in place. Just kind of press, press while that glue is drying. Fluff our bow a little bit. Oh my gosh, how cute is that bow? I love it. 
And then I'm going to take my covered button and we're just gonna run a little bit of glue on the covered button as well, like on the sides really, because it doesn't really have shanks. And then we're just gonna secure that, that little button there. And that's it. Um, once we have our covered button in place, you could use a little metal shape if you wanted to, or a wood, a wood star, or a wood button, or, or a real button, whatever the case may be, or a fabric button if you wanted. You could do pretty much anything that you like here. I'm just gonna hold that in place. I actually held it while I did cleaning with my other hand. Probably would not have had to hold it that long, but you know. Anyway, I hope this has inspired you guys. Thank you again so very much for stitching along with the Flossiversary Summer Sal 2023 with the patriotic theme. I love to seeing everybody's stitches it's been such a fun four or five weeks here uh, with the bonus videos and all of that stuff. And I am looking forward to starting our Christmas in July sale next week. So thank you guys. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comments down below. Thank you as always for watching me and we will see you guys all next time. Bye. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel, click that like button, and don't forget to hit the notification bell to always be notified when I have a new floss tube stitching or quilting video. Thank you guys so much for joining me today, and we'll see you next time.